Hi. I talk for a living. <laughs> and every time I come in front of a new audience, even just a friendly one from Keithley, I always get this sort of sense it's going to take me a few minutes to get used to speaking to you. And I can't follow Nick. Where's he gone? Oh my God. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. And then the toucan made me laugh. So I got that. That was like brilliant. I was the one that guffawed at the back. So I'm Ian. Um, I'm from Bradford. So that's all right, is it? Um, work at the University of Bradford, and I've practiced as a barrister in Bradford for 22 years, although I am a Huddersfield Town fan, because I was brought up there for a while, and that's where I learned to watch football. So, nice to be back on my own turf, and I just live up, up the road as well. So, this is about artificial intelligence. How do we follow that with what we've just had? <laughs> it's a difficult one, isn't it? And this is normally a two-hour workshop for post-grad students. It's now going to be 15 minutes for somebody that likes to talk for a living, um, this is going to be a struggle. I call this, a Should We Be Afraid, the original research programme I'm looking at with the universities about regulation of AI, regulation of data storage, um, do, do robots have human rights and so on and so forth. It's that sort of an investigation, um, which is a bit dry, I think, for this. But what I found was speaking to students who I thought would be really up for AI, um, they weren't that interested or they were afraid of it. I said, who's afraid of AI? And they sort of put, sort of put their hands up. Really? Oh, robots taking over the world, nicking our jobs. <laughs> Have you heard of the Luddites? <laughs> um, I said, they do that at your school anymore. No, okay, well, well, let's just have a think about what artificial intelligence is because I think there are a lot of misconceptions. There we are. Who knows that one? <laughs> He's nice. He, she, they. I don't know. Very friendly. Bit of a coward. Yeah. A bipedal humanoid protocol droid. Could speak a billion languages. And always ran away. Other end of the spectrum. I do a lot of mountain walking and climbing. And I, uh, I go walking with a chap who I call the Terminator, it can't be bargained with, it can't be reasoned with, it doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear, and it absolutely will not stop. So we like this, don't we? We like this idea of um, what I might call the uh, Frankenstein ex machina. I only watched that because she's really lovely, <laughs> but it's actually quite a good film. She turns on her captors, and that's, I think we like that in artificial intelligence, don't we? The idea that somebody starts off being just a machine, but then learns from the human and then becomes better than the human, and it's, and it's Skynet all over again. It becomes self-aware. And I think that scares people also. So it does come down, I think, to people looking back as far back as Mary Shelley did. And when did she write? Frankenstein, early 1820s, 19th century. So this is not new. Don't think, oh, we're making robots and we're really trendy. Uh, that girl was doing it 200 odd years ago um, with Frankenstein. And what happened to Frankenstein? Oh, the monster, sorry, went a bit loopy. Bit of a human at the end. Did anybody study at English literature A level? No, no. <laughs> What's he on about? Move on, next slide. <laughs> But we know what we mean, don't we? The, what I'm trying to convey is there. Transam, I can't remember which model it was. I think it was a Transam. Who recognises that? You need to be over 40 something. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it was brilliant. Didn't we want one of them? Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Now, actually, apart from sort of bazookas and um, a turbo boost jumps over bridges and stuff, that's pretty much state of the art today, isn't it? We can do that. Cars can drive, AI can talk, it can recognise you. We're going to be moving on to effective computing, because this would say, hey David, you sound a bit depressed today. He didn't say it like that, he said it in a more cool way. <laughs> <laughs> but it could detect whether its driver, played by David Hasselhoff, rings a bell, um, was happy or sad or depressed or whatever, or scared. Now that's something that we're moving to. Cars can drive themselves, they can think for us. Anybody with a reasonably modern car 
auto cruise control, all you need to do is steer, set the speed, and that's it. So that is a reality. But more so, this is a reality. It's machines that can learn, or we can teach to learn, a machine that can learn from its own mistakes. So this deep blue um, computer, um, I think it was made by Google, um, 1997, finally beat Gary Kasparov, took him six games, I think. Six games. Um, 1996, pretty much lost, did Deep Blue to Gary Kasparov. But in 1997 rematch, it became a bit of a draw. And then the computer beat the world's greatest ever chess champion. At the time, people said, even people that were into this, way back in 1997, this is not possible. And here's the rub. It's not possible because it's not just about numbers. It takes intuition. It takes skill. It takes experience. It takes a human attribute to play a game or play a sport. And what they realised was, in actual fact, there are a finite number of moves, ultimately, the machine can learn and it can think faster than a human can, no matter how experienced that person is. And the element of human emotion, which leads to intuition and so on and so forth, could be beaten by a computer. Um, so there he is with his head in his hands. Watson. This is about 2011 US TV show called Jeopardy million pound or million dollars, of course it is over there, prizes, you're nodding, you've seen it, I've never seen it. Well I have, when I did some research to look at it and find out where it was. But this is a machine that beat the world, well it would be the world quiz champion, wouldn't it? Like they have the World Series in the US, the, the US, the US quiz champion. It, it could answer every single question put to it, apart from one or two nuanced questions, which it couldn't get its head, virtual head, round. And it won the prize of a million pounds, which was donated to charity. Of course, did Watson know that it had won? Probably not. It had no understanding in that sense. Even if we have what was called effective computing, which is recognising whether I'm a happy, sad, um, or whatever, Watson couldn't appreciate that that was something to marvel about because it had not been programmed to do so. Not been programmed to have that level of understanding. So, when we talk about artificial intelligence, I think we've all got this misconception. Because the reason um, Deep Blue won, and the reason um, the Jeopardy champions were beaten by computers, was nothing to do with something that was going to become alive and start taking over the planet. It was to do with this, big data. I hope it's an expression that most of you are familiar with, but otherwise it says what it does on the tin. An exploding and exponential growth in computing power. Now, most of you look like you were alive in 2020, which is where this story might start for convenience. Some of you were very glad you weren't alive in 2020, otherwise you'd be twice as old as you are. Um, but I'm going to go back to 2020 and just do some comparisons to try and give you an idea as to the pace of change which we have all lived through, but I think quite unwittingly, including myself until I started looking into this. There are four facets really that make up what we can say about big data, machine learning and what makes AI possible. Data creation, data traffic, that's where moving around the world, Storing that data, how can we store it? And then the speed at which we can, tr can transmit it. Perhaps I should put storage after speed or before traffic, but it doesn't really matter. So creation, traffic, storage and speed. Just look at those facts there. Eric Schmidt, who was the chief executive of Google in 2002, said... Every two days we create as much data as we did from the dawn of civilization until 2002. We were creating huge amounts of data. Difficult how you prove that. Um, but we now think 
um, that 90% of the world's existing data ever created has been developed in the last two years. Instagram, Twitter, all the things on your phones, photographs that you take. 30, 40 years ago, you, you parents, <laughs> or yourselves, depending on how old you are, may have taken just a handful of photographs on a holiday or during a day. Today, we're taking billions of photographs around the world. I took a photograph at a railway station today just because it had a change to the timetable. That's data, that's been stored. It may go straight to the cloud if I set my phone to that. It may back up later, but it is storage and it's massive amounts of information. We're going to come across a figure which I had to look up because um, I just can't get my head around it. Any mathematicians in here can give me some idea as to what a terabyte is. It's a one followed by 21 zeros. Is it a, is it a trillion, trillion? I thought it was 10 to the 12. No, it's 10 to the 12. 12. 21. Anyway, it's... It's, I googled it, yeah. right? <laughs> it's 21 zeros after a one. Um, in terms of the amount of data we have in the world at the minute, in 2000 we considered that we had 44 of those ones followed by 21 zeros. By 2025, estimates 175 of those ones followed by 21 zeros. So in five years, that's four times, roughly, four times the amount of data. We're, and that's exponential growth. It's growing all the time. Some of it is absolutely useless. Some of it is like, you know, recordings of my lectures at university and stuff like that. That's quite, it's a gigabyte an hour, isn't it, if it's done in HD? <laughs> so, um, yeah, a lot of it is rubbish, but it is information that is there and available. Ooh, blank screen. Oh, it's doing it. Traffic. So this is the amount of uh, traffic that moves around the world. So in, um, this might help us put a zettabyte into focus because a zettabyte, a 0 0.02 zettabytes is 50 billion gigabytes. I don't know how many ZX spectrums that is, but it's a lot. Um, and you make, wow, that's loads. And you think, well, is it that incredible that we, did it, we increased that by 60 times in 15 years? We sort of get that, don't you? Now we're sort of understanding. You think, well, that's all right. Um, and then you say, actually, it's going to, in two years, from 2020 to 2022, it went up half again. And that's data moving around the world, being transferred digitally. Not in paper form, but in digital form. Um, and I've already got that there, so it's, a zettabyte is one trillion gigabytes, that's it. And there, are, and there are, was it 1K on a ZX Spectrum when it came out? I've got that up in a minute, and then 16 with the backup on it. So the traffic is massive and growing all the time, you know, a, a thousand times more or whatever than it was back in 2015. Please pick me up on my maths. My maths only come in when it comes to charging a bill. <laughs> and I actually get somebody else to do that for me. So, storage. Um, not unusual to have an iPhone nowadays with 512 gigabytes on. 64 is the standard. You can pay a bit more and get 512. Certainly you can with a Samsung, who always got the bigger figures. Um, but when I first bought a digital camera back in 2000, it came with an 8 megabyte card. And you could take like two rolls of film and it's like, oh, wow. I didn't know what you did with them then. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're supposed to do with them. You could, um, no phones to put them on. Um, but, you know, that's what we're looking at. That's a 64,000 times increase in something that is just able to put in our pockets. That's the, that's the thing, isn't it? And the, with nanotechnology, that's going to get even bigger because the experts <laughs> don't say this is eventually going to stop. There's no physics stopping this. So a car could do 200 miles an hour in the 60s. Yeah, they did that around Grand Prix. They did that in races when Ford won the um, 1966 Le Mans. Got to speeds of 200 miles an hour. Not much quicker now. 
Land speed record, 600 odd miles an hour in the 80s, not much quicker now. I'm being told I've got two minutes left. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Wrapping it up. So that increase in storage is um, enormous and there's nothing to stop it. There's no physically thing stopping it. That's difficult to get your head around. The numbers are just bonkers, aren't they? They're bigger than a barrister's bill. So <laughs> speed, 56 kilobytes. 2000, through telephone line, I'm going to speak really, really quickly now, and if you picked up the phone, you can, internet went down, or somebody was trying to ring you, they'd say, can't get hold of you yesterday. <laughs> Sorry, we had the internet on, you couldn't watch anything. Um, you could just pick up emails. Um, so 25 megabits is what you get up in Skipton, near where I am, just through an ordinary line, 446 times quicker, 446 times quicker, I've only got a minute left. The fastest in the UK is 900 meg, according to Virgin in London. I don't believe anything that they say, but just do the math. That's 18,000 times faster. It's, the numbers are astonishing. Are you afraid yet? <laughs> is there anything to be afraid about? <laughs> I'm afraid because I can't finish. Um, anyway, there to be afraid about <laughs> how our data is used. The data points and the algorithms that they can find on you, Cambridge Analytica found 5,000 data points on every US voter when um, they were engaged by Donald Trump's Republicans to win and I'm counting down now. Please don't be afraid. Please invite me back for the 15 minutes and I'll finish. <laughs> there we are. Thank you very much. Sorry I couldn't get through it but the slides are there. That's what I would have said. Have a look at what Richard Suskin says. <laughs>